Nick, the anthropic principle has become an important probe for the nature of reality. Are there multiple universes? Does it support a theistic hypothesis? Uh, can it be used in physics? There's a lot of heated argumentation about it. It's a hot topic. You've come at it very differently in terms of questioning the, the, the theoretical underpinnings of what it, what it means. And I really would love to hear your, your understanding of it. Well, I think that the um, um, anthropic principle, so-called, has, has been misunderstood. Uh, and it's been interpreted in so many different ways. Um, and for that reason, I think some people uh, are dismissive of it because it has also been used for nonsensical purposes. But I think, um, like an onion, if you peel off all the layers of misunderstanding and error, and uh, there is at the core of it um, a really important methodological insight. And that is that um, when drawing inferences from the evidence we have, we have to consider observation selection effects. Um, and to explain what an observation selection effect is, it might help first explain what a selection effect is. Uh, so a trivial example would be, you want to estimate the, how big is the biggest fish in a pond. Um, and so you catch a lot of fish, and you si see that they're all smaller um, than six inches long. All the fish that you have caught, you caught 200 fish, they're all smaller than that. So you think, okay, well maybe uh, the biggest fish is not much more than six inches, because otherwise probably you would have caught one. But then you realize that the, me the instrument you used to catch all these fish, say it was a net, couldn't actually catch larger fish than six inches. So in, in this example, the uh, data co collection instrument, the fishing net, introduces a selection effect. It can only select data points from a certain part of the distribution, in this case, the small fish. Um, and so these are standard, there are statistical methods of taking these into account, and it's well recognized that you have to do this. But the observation selection effect is a special kind of selection effect, um, which is a lot more intricate um, and confusing, and it's only recently that people have really begun to pay attention to these. And they are selection effect introduced not by limitations in our measurement apparatus, but by the fact that all the data we have presupposes the existence of a suitably positioned observer to have the data and to build the instruments in the first place that right. collect the data. Um, and it turns out that these observation selection effects are very important um, in non-trivial ways, in complicated, um, puzzling ways, in, for example, cosmology. Uh, but not only in cosmology, also in some other fields. There are certain questions about evolutionary biology, for example, where you need to take these into account. Well, let's, let's focus on cosmology, because right. that's where the anthropic principle has its greatest potential power to reflect on the, whether there's a god or not, or whether there's multiple universes. Mm -hmm. So how would the observation, observational selection effect impact the anthropic principle in cosmology? Well, so in cosmology, the role for the anthropic principle or taking observation selection effects into account yes. um, comes in, in a couple of different, several different applications. So, so one is that if you have a view of the universe or the cosmos, according to which it's very, very big, it might be infinitely big, maybe there are even many different universes in the totality of physical existence. And then you want to ask, what does such a theory predict that we should observe? Because that's the way ultimately all scientific theories have to be tested. They've got to make some predictions about sure. it. Um, but if the world is sufficiently big and variegated, then the theory predicts that all possible observations will be made by somebody somewhere. So the question arises, how can you test such a theory? It seems to uh, imply that anything we observe is consistent with the theory, because if the theory says all possible observations are made by somebody somewhere... Well, all observations are, are made in situations in which it's possible to have observers, that's different. Yeah, but if you think of an infinitely large universe, to take the limiting case, yes. 
you would have within that infinite universe brains, whole human bodies for that matter, in all possible state instantiated somewhere or another. Um, so you would have people having delusions, you would have people spontaneously materializing from black holes, you would have people living in parts of the world where by random things just look very different. Um, and so the question arises, how can such a theory be tested? Because whatever we observe, the theory implies that such an observation should be made. Um, and yet such theories can be tested. Cosmologists are doing this all the time. And, and here is one role for um, observation selection theory, which is to connect such theories with observation. And basically the core idea is that you should think of um, your own observations or yourself as if they were randomly sampled from the set of all observations that are made, all observers. So that at the end of the day, if the theory implies that most observations, the greatest fraction, some suitable sense of those words, are of a certain kind, then that's what the theory predicts that you should observe. Uh, so in, a, in one use of, of it, the uh, observation selection theory is a link between theory and observational predictions, that you need to link up the two. Um, one application of anthropic reasoning in cosmology is, of course, to try to explain the appearance of fine-tuning. Um, so fine-tuning is the apparent fact that if any of several different constants or parameters had been even slightly different, uh, then no life could have existed in our universe. Right. Um, so gravitation being slightly stronger, universe recollapses quickly after Big Bang. Uh, slightly weaker, there is just a hydrogen gas that gets more and more diluted. No the, stars, no planets. Uh, uh, um, and there are a couple of other things that look like they are kind of, you know, balancing on a knife's edge, and that's puzzling. I mean, because it's not just to, one of them; it's uh, it's a well, whole sequence. Yeah, it seems like there is. Um, and so there are several different possibilities here. One is that. Um, it's just happenstance. Um, the values uh, had to take on some magnitude and they might just happen to have the right values. And I think you can... And we're real lucky. In a sense. Um, but... Um, and there are some people that have held that that's a perfectly acceptable view. I don't yeah. think so. Um, and if you work out conditional probabilities, you can see that if there is some hypothesis that gives this outcome a much higher probability, and if the hypothesis itself is relatively simple, then you should believe that rather than this chance. But it's a logical possibility. Sure. Um, another is that the appearance of fine-tuning is merely appearance. So you could imagine that some future physics genius will come up with this really simple theory that shows that all the constants and parameters had to have exactly these values, and sure. it follows from super-duper symmetry, and it just falls out, and <laughs> right, right. lo and behold. And it couldn't be any other way. Yeah, uh, given some very simple yeah, assumption. Right, right. Um, so that's a possibility. I mean, it looks like it's too much to hope for at the moment, but, you know, it's difficult to predict future genius breakthroughs. So, um, so those are two. Now, the remaining two possibilities are the design hypothesis, which is that um, the values of these parameters were picked by some intelligent designer with a view of uh, making the universe hospitable to intelligent life. Um, so that, that, that would imply that the, val the constants had the values they had. Now it has separate problems like, you know, um, um, what kind of creator could this be, uh, sure. you know, problem of evil, etc., etc., etc. And the, the final possibility is the multiverse. Uh, hypothesis, which is actually a class of different theories, physical theories, um, which imply that the bit of the universe that we can see is just a tiny proportion of the whole. And, and you can get all different possibilities, so every possibility will occur someplace. Yeah, or even there would be versions of this where you might not literally get all possibilities, it's just a very broad range. And then the anthropic principle would come in and say that if the totality of physical existence contains all of these universes, only a few of which are life permitting, then that theory predicts that we should observe what exactly, well, exactly what we are observing, and that we are find ourselves in this universe which is life permitting. That's where all the observers will be. So 
Um, so and, how does observation selection analysis help us with those alternatives? Well, so to make the last explanation work, the multiverse hypothesis, you've got to take into account, I mean, so naively one might think that if there are all these different universes and most of them are lifeless, doesn't that theory then predict that uh, we should have a lifeless universe? And, and if you think just for a little bit about that, I mean, you realize that no, it doesn't predict that we should find a lifeless universe because uh, um, all the people in that theory would be in life-containing universes. And, and so um, the universe would appear to be fine-tuned. Uh, but that's only because uh, we only see a small part of the totality of physical existence. So the idea would be that the multiverse itself would not have to be fine-tuned. If these theories work as advertised, um, you wouldn't have to tweak the parameters of the multiverse theory. That's, that's the hope. The multiverse theory produces a whole host of different universes. Some of them, by chance, are life-permitting, and those are the ones where, by necessity, we would find ourselves in. Um, and so that's... That's a, almost like a trivial application of observation selection theory. Um, but it gets more complicated once you start to take into account facts like, in reality, it might not be that some universes are life permitting and some are not, and that they're all there to I mean, there might be that different universes are life permitting to different degrees. It might be that most, some universes contain many more observers, and some might contain just a few, and a lot of them might contain none. Um, there might be different numbers of these different kinds of universes. So how do you? So at some point you got to take probabilities into account. You got to sort of come up with principles that are probabilistic, and and that's when when it starts getting tricky, um, because the most intuitively plausible principle for doing this, which would be something like think of yourself as a random sample from all observers that exist, yeah. um, turns out when you think through the consequences, that that leads to paradoxes. There are various thought experiments where you can show that this has very counterintuitive results. So then you have to go back and try to rethink the assumptions and see if you can come up with a methodology that caters to all the legitimate scientific needs. So where do you end up? I end up with um, an observation selection theory that provides methodological guidance for these inferences. Um, and the fine-tuning explanation turns out to work, provided that there actually is a multiverse of a suitable kind. So you actually got to postulate a real physically existent multiverse, but then theoretically you could explain why ours appear fine-tuned if you do that. Um, it wouldn't help to have an ensemble of merely possible universes, for example. Um, and uh, So your analysis, which is very rigorous, basically supports the idea that there still are these four real possibilities, that it's either a brute fact that there's some underlying principle of simplicity that'll force it to be what it is, a design hypothesis, be it theist or some other design hypothesis, and a real multiverse. Except that I would rule out the first one. Um, I think my analysis shows that it would be um, implausible to attribute this to brute chance. So it's really one of the three, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and then you might have independent reasons for believing or not believing in design. I mean, that there are whole separate issues with that.